On January 30, 1935, the Arthur D. Story, an Essex-built fishing schooner consigned to the Gorton Pew and Davis Brothers Fisheries, was docked at Ben Pine's Atlantic Supply Wharf on the Gloucester waterfront. Her captain was William Nickerson, the vice president of the Gloucester Master Mariners Association. Named for Essex's most renowned shipbuilder, the Arthur D. Story was one of the fleet of schooners supervised by Ben Pine, who had used this particular boat to compete in the schooner races of 1929. That wintry morning, the crew left for Newfoundland, where they would take on 1,120 barrels of salt and frozen herring, before heading home on March 1st. It turned out to be their last voyage, as the boat vanished without a trace after being engulfed in a horrific storm. My friend and business partner, Joseph M. Cody, worked for Ben Pine as a clerk in his outfitting store, and Cody was to go on this vessel. At the last minute, or within a few days of the departure, Miss Adams announced to Joe Cody, you're not going on the story because we need you back in the shop. Uh, ben Pine is sick. I need you to work here. So Cody, disappointed as he was, reluctantly accepted the, the, the command from Miss Adams, who uh, was the boss, uh, to stay ashore. And of course, well, the Arthur D. story, all hands were lost on that vessel. 1935 would turn out to be one of the 20th century's worst years for hurricanes, a fact that would later overshadow the importance of the intense storm the Arthur D. Story encountered in icy waters on March 3rd. She had such a load, they even put Heron down in the forecastle, which is the forward part of the cruise quarters. They even carried cargo in the forecastle. So when she went out, she was down by the head, uh, encountered heavy weather, and she kept right on going, just like a submarine. Days after Captain Nickerson's boat vanished, the halibut schooner American, captained by Simon Terrio, limped into Gloucester after having survived 44 hours in the grips of the same storm. Simon called it the worst he had ever seen. After seeing the extensive damage to the American, the Arthur D. Story and its crew were given up for lost. Its crew, all Gloucester residents, contained two St. John's parishioners. The oldest was William Enos Wolfe, the 66-year-old cook. The youngest was Ralph Fiander, the 21-year-old engineer. At the 1030 service on Sunday, April 13th, the Reverend Joseph Cooper led the parish in prayer for William and Ralph. As with so many of Gloucester's fishing families, the Fianders of 16 Oak Street were only too familiar with suffering. The year Ralph was born, his father Hubert died when the schooner Rita Cluett was lost off Newfoundland. His uncle Ralph was killed when the oil tanker Gulfland exploded at Port Arthur, Texas in 1928. And his stepfather, Thomas Best, would later die when the trawler Inca sunk after colliding with a freighter. In a pew with his mother and stepfather that day was Ralph's teenage brother, Hubert Jr., a member of the St. John's Choir. In a few years, Hubert would become an outstanding and popular student at Gloucester High School, a commanding officer of his ROTC detachment and vice president of his senior class in 1938. He would go on to graduate at the head of his class at West Point, enlist in the Signal Corps before volunteering for the paratroops. He would become a courageous leader, effectively commanding his men on battlefields in Italy and France, where in 1944, Hubert Jr. would pay the ultimate sacrifice. He is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. On the website of the West Point Association of Graduates is this testimonial. The essence of the man was a simple and natural devotion to the welfare of others, a keystone of his character which was evidenced so quietly as to be unrecognized by all but his intimates. The fact that his devotion extended to giving his life was a natural expression of his selflessness, and in his mind would merit no commendatory letters or appropriate verse. <laughs>
Hello, I'm the Reverend Brett Hayes, and welcome to part four of the history of St. John's Gloucester. This segment covers the last half of the 1930s and the years of World War II. You'll hear the personal stories of St. John's parishioners who lived through this experience of trauma and triumph. It was a uniquely difficult period in world history, but St. John's continued to show resilience in the face of tragedies great and small by providing relief and hope for the people of Cape Ann. When the Reverend Joseph Cooper, the longest serving rector in the history of St. John's, retired at the end of 1936, the man who replaced him was only four months on the job when the parish received the devastating news of Cooper's death. Robert Knoll Rodenmayer had come from the Church of the Epiphany in New York City. He quickly became popular in the parish. Living with his wife Alice at the rectory on Washington Street, they instituted an open-door policy and young people were especially encouraged to drop by. Rodenmayer covered services in Essex, Gloucester, and Rockport. The rectory had been newly papered and painted, and in the following months other renovations were contracted by the vestry. The exterior was painted, the back stairway was removed, and the dining room ceiling replaced. A year later, in the early afternoon of December 15th, a passerby on Washington Street noticed smoke swirling out of the rectory's roof. The person pounded on the front door and alerted Alice Rodenmayer, who grabbed their new baby and moved to the safety of the Robert Thompson residence next door. The firemen had a hard time battling the blaze due to heat and smoke, but successfully limited the fire damage to the attic. As the home suffered extensive water damage, the vestry allocated $2,100 for repair and restoration. The major event at St. John's in 1938 was the 75th anniversary celebration held in May. Father Rodemeyer supplemented the usual 7.30 and 11 o'clock services with a special anniversary service held in the evening. Miss Grace Thompson, whose parents Charles and Abby Thompson were among the original founders of St. John's, gave a presentation detailing the parish history. Former rector Albert Watkins, who had served in 1890, came by train from Kansas City to attend. The people most responsible for making a major contribution to the fisheries were the people from the Canadian Maritimes. Uh, the main fishing grounds uh, of the day were off in Nova Scotia and of course uh, the famous Grand Banks and Sable Island. That made them major contributors to the industry because they knew the grounds. They had worked there in the past. Often the first generation were fishermen, usually the skippers. Uh, I mean, they worked their way up to being skippers. Uh, quite frankly, the second generation tended not to go to sea. They would stay on land and uh, do things like uh, lumber yards, uh, foremen in the shipbuilding. Uh, it was just such a dangerous life that if they could, when they got here, they would uh, have businesses that were peripheral to the fishing, but did not, in fact, go to sea. My mother's ancestors came and settled in around Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. The uh, Anglican Church was in Lunenburg, but my mother's people lived outside, and they were mainly lived on a set of three islands off of Lunenburg. And the closest uh, church was the Anglican Church. So we wound up there, this that they did. My father was an engineer on a, the fishing boats. My mother did housework, you know, homekeeper. And uh, they moved here to Gloucester. 
And I think probably the reason is employment. Uh, Cecil Moulton was a, a mutual friend of Ben Pines. He was also a Newfoundlander, and he was a contemporary of Ben Pines. Unlike Piney, Cecil was an expert fisherman and, of course, was one of the outstanding captains of the era. He was a captain on the fishing boats. Of course, they did. that. They, they were in a position to do better than the average person back then. They worked very hard for the church. My mother wasn't uh, so involved. She baked for the church, like, it, during the fairs and that. But uh, my mother was busy at home trying to survive. My parents were from Newfoundland. Uh, my dad was from Ballorum, and my mother was from uh, Connerbrook. Dad was first as he got a ride on a boat into Gloucester, and he kept busy. He went fishing with the biggest kind of skippers, and he did a lot of uh, side work on his own fishing, and he was very, very handy. And had anything to do with the water, but to, to pound a nail into a garage door, he could never do it. But anything to do with uh, the water, he's, he's right there. He was skipper of the Gertrude Altivo during the uh, races. In 1932, they won the race. So my mother came over and uh, they lived up on Friend Street. We kept things going when Dad was fishing. Dad used to go for 30 days at a trip. And sometimes he'd get home in 14 days. You never knew, you couldn't plan a heck of a lot because you didn't know when he was going to come in. Come in when the boat got full is when he came in, but sometimes it was short trips and sometimes it was long trips. Mrs. Moulton was uh, quite active in the Women's Auxiliary. They had uh, the Newfoundland Society because a lot of St. John's people were Newfoundlanders. And we had wonderful times. And uh, her fish chowders, fish, baked fish suppers were the top thing. Delivering papers, I used to deliver the glass of Daily Times. And I used to deliver anywhere from 100 to 102 times a day, so five days a week. I was, I was about uh, eight, I guess. It used to take me two and a half hours a day to deliver the papers. One day, the fish for the church supper never made it to St. John's. So Ida Moulton instructed Russell to head to the waterfront, fetch the fish, and haul it back in the wagon he used for his paper route. And what happened is I used to have the little red cart, little red cart with the sides. And uh, one day my mother called. She couldn't get nobody to go down to get them. So I went, took my little red cart and went down to Berkey's Wharf. Now Berkey's Wharf is, is uh, down off of Roger Street. Uh, where right now is the uh, pilot house. Went down there and they gave me the fish to take up in the car, little red cart up to the church here where mom used to take the fish and got them out and clean them up and cut them the way she wanted them to make fish chowders or baked haddock or whatever the gang here at the church wanted. Of course, once, once the fish was gone, I had to start scrubbing my little red wagon, get all that fish out of it. So I always had to make sure that that cart was clean. And when I didn't, my mother always made sure it was clean before I went down to the Times office on Center Street. I went to boarding school in September of 1939. And of course, Europe was at war then. And so we were very much aware of the war. And uh, I remember we had to read Mein Kampf in my school. <laughs> The librarian was very insistent that we read that book, and we did. And uh, so we knew all about Hitler, and, uh, and uh, eventually we had rationing and uh, meals where you just had soup and bread, so you'd understand what people were going through, supposedly. And we made things for the war, so the war was very much with us.
uh, I joined the Nevada and Bremerton Navy Yard, and uh, they assigned me a couple of guns to super supervise. But I got bored. And one day I was talking to the uh, engineering officer. He hadn't gotten enough commissioned officers in the engineering department, so he needed another guy. This was a modern battleship, 1914 style, and this was an oil-fired boiler. And they knew an ensign didn't know anything, so they were very patient with me and t taught me all the tricks of the trade, which was very lucky for me. So we got out to Hawaii. Heaven! Beautiful weather. And Hawaiian girls are gorgeous. So we had a great summer. By this time, I had everything under control. And then one day, on a Sunday, we were at assembly. Make sure everybody on, was on board who was supposed to be on board. As we stood watching the flag being raised and the bands playing the national anthem, and they started playing faster and faster and faster. And I couldn't figure out what it was all about. but. What we didn't see was the airplanes and the bullets flying. And uh, suddenly, it called all hands to general quarters. That's, that's battle stations. And then when the word came over, we are being attacked by aircraft of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Get underway. I didn't have to say a damn thing. These guys jumped on it so fast. By 20 minutes, we were up to steam. And I will tell you this, I was scared to death. Meanwhile, up, up above, all hell broke loose. The only battleship in the place that got underway. And the Japanese leaped on it. If they could sink us in the channel, between the rest of the island and Fort Island, where, where the fleet was tied up, they'd have us trapped inside the harbor. And the admiral in charge knew that we were in danger, so he ordered us to run our ground on Fort Island. We were on fire. Everything that hit the Arizona, which was berthed ahead of us, would have hit us. The Arizona was blown up because the ammunition ship that we had l loaded up with our main battery ammunition so we, they could do some welding was all alongside the Arizona where they were intending to weld on, on Monday. And that's why the, the Arizona blew up. The torpedoes hit this ammunition ship. We stayed fighting fires. And all these towboats were desperate to keep us from blowing up. Well, there was still ammunition on the ship. We had to stay on the ship in the B Division to keep up steam for the pumps. It was a Sunday, and on Sunday, we, this school had quiet hour every Sunday afternoon. You either had to be in your room or in the library or listening to the classical music in Red Hall. And I happened to be listening to classical music in Red Hall when the headmistress came out and announced about Pearl Harbor. And then we were all summoned to school and told what, what had happened and so forth. The year after the disaster of Pearl Harbor, America devoted its energy to preparing troops for battle and establishing a manufacturing base unlike the country had ever seen. It was also the year when Robert Noel Rodemir made the decision to leave Gloucester. After several months of searching, the vestry called Reverend John Thorne Golding, who was then serving at a parish on Martha's Vineyard. Golding was to come in November, but ended up coming a month earlier. Sadly, his wife had lost the baby she was carrying, and John felt it better 
to not put the transition off by another month. Although it would be another year before our troops would land in North Africa, the battle for the Atlantic was raging. Gloucester, being rich and experienced seafarers, saw many of its own sign up for duty on the merchant ships attempting to supply both Britain and Russia. The losses were staggering. At war's end, 3,500 merchant ships and 175 warships had sunk in the North Atlantic. St. John's parishioner Gilbert Francis Brown, a 1936 graduate of Gloucester High School, was a meat cutter at the A&P on Main Street, and he lived with his wife Thelma at 100 Denison Street. After the war started, Gilbert joined the Merchant Marine and served three crossings as a fireman, working the engine room of the troop ship Dorchester. In the middle of the night of February 3, 1943, the Dorchester was torpedoed by a German U-boat and sank 25 minutes later. Of the 904 people on board, 674 died, Gilbert Brown among them. The Dorchester's loss was notable also for the story of the four chaplains who sacrificed their lives by giving their life jackets to others. Several books and a movie have been made based on this story. Many deaths were due to exposure as the other ships in the convoy did what they could to pick hundreds of men out of the freezing water. It was initially believed that Brown died trapped in the engine room, but his body was returned to Gloucester after the war and he was buried with full military honors at Cherry Hill Cemetery. Undaunted by the reported loss of her husband, Thelma Brown left her job at the Watertown Arsenal and enlisted in the Navy's waves. A few months after Gilbert Brown's death, Reverend Golding created a special war shrine. This was located in the front of the sanctuary on the left. A small altar designed by architect George Young of Rockport was flanked by two American flags and draped with docils representing the various branches of the armed services. Beside the altar was a prayer desk with candlesticks donated by Mr. and Mrs. John Brown in memory of their son Gilbert. The honor roll displayed the 116 names of parishioners then on active duty. Central to the shrine was a standard school-type composition notebook for the purpose of intercessory prayer. In it were names of relatives and friends serving overseas. Eventually there were over 300 entries. Some names entered multiple times. The service flag had 72 stars, one gold star for Gilbert Brown, and 71 blue stars. Each year, Christmas boxes were made up by the parishioners and sent to our men and women overseas. One soldier wrote from the South Pacific, Your Christmas package arrived today, and once more I am indebted to you for your thoughtfulness and consideration. It is a deep comfort to know I am not forgotten, and I am more grateful than it is possible for mere words to convey. May God give us the fortitude, strength, and wisdom to put a quick stop to the terrible madness which we know and define as war. Adele Irvin's brother, was killed in January of 1943. He was, uh, he was a uh, dive bomber pilot, off, first off the Yorktown, then off the Enterprise. He was lost off the Enterprise. And uh, he won the Silver Star. He was, he was a fine, fine young man. Mm -hmm. A class of 1940 at Harvard. Um, and uh, yeah, he was a great loss. Henry Nicholas Irvin, known as Skip. With the war on, Adele Irvin's family moved to Canada so her father could work as the assistant air attaché for the Canadian Air Corps. I, meanwhile, had graduated from school. I wasn't college material anyway, and I knew that. But I would have gone into the service if I had. But I felt that I, my mother just, her husband had just gone off 
to Europe, and her son had just uh, died, and anyway. Under Golding's leadership, the Couples Club was reorganized in 1944 and became very useful in the repairing and painting of the church property and providing social life not only for their own members, but also for men and women in the armed services. During this time, the exterior of the church was painted. The sacristy, the kitchen, the dining room, and the cloakroom in the parish house were all renovated. Learning that the house next to the church owned by Captain Benham was for sale, Mr. Golding suggested that the vestry should consider its purchase in order to protect the church property and to provide a more convenient location for the rectory. After the vestry had decided on the purchase, Mrs. Philip M. Rhinelander, the widow of Bishop Rhinelander, generously provided the funds needed, and the old rectory was sold. On March 16, 1945, Father Golding presented his resignation, having applied for a chaplaincy in the Navy. His friends in both parishes saw him go with deep regret. Bill Chapin was in high school when the war started. After graduation, he spent two years in military school and then entered the Coast Guard in 1943. A year later, he was promoted to quartermaster and assigned a ship. My first assignment, my only one, was as quartermaster on a destroyer escort, convoy duty to the Mediterranean and back. Yeah, destroyer escort. They're about 20 feet short of a DD, a regular destroyer. Convoys had six DEs as as escorts on a zigzag course. We were taking troops and supplies across to Algeria, but also the Coast Guard was key in the invasion of Europe. Soon thereafter, for whatever reason, I was promoted, I guess, to take the wheel during general quarters, because I had been a good helmsman. In 1945, near the end of the war in Europe, the Merrill was on its third and final return crossing of the Atlantic. A cyclonic disturbance was reported, essentially a hurricane, which caused the Merrill and other ships in the convoy to endure huge waves caused by the high winds. 21-year-old Bill Chapin, at the wheel, steering the ship directly into the waves, had the exhausting task of keeping the ship from capsizing hour after hour while the huge storm slowly passed. Frightful sea conditions. The bullnose is a ring on the bow where the hawser goes through, and that bullnose would be buried underwater. Well, it would be in a trough, and then we'd rise, <laughs> thankfully, high enough to be able to get over the crest of the, of the next sea. Everything below the, the deck itself was totally awash. It was like we, it wasn't visible. The wheelhouse where I was, water was sloshing around on the deck, and that was 40 feet above the water line. The captain of the ship, who may have achieved his rank through political connections, was terrified and provided no help. He came out from the sea cabin to the wheelhouse and stood by me one, at one moment of this frightening experience and said, Chapin, watch it, we're going to broach. Well, broaching means going sideways to the sea. That would have been it. Well, we weren't going to broach. I wasn't going to allow it if there was any chance. But he just lost his confidence and <clears throat> retreated. Eventually, it did calm down, of course, and all of the flotilla were able to regroup and continue on our zigzag course back to New York. Now, uh, there was a strong element of faith involved in my going about the job. On the one hand, everything was happening so fast I couldn't really think about much of anything other than looking to 
get over to the next sea. But I never did feel that there was any question other than that we were going to make it. It was a, it was a, a moment of truth for, in many ways. In April, the war with Germany ended. Bill Chapin and the others aboard the Merrill were ordered to sail to the Pacific to help fight the Japanese. Luckily for Bill, the war ended by the time he made it to Honolulu, where he and his shore leave buddies really had something to celebrate. In Blossa, that was a momentous event. Horns bled, bells rang from churches, the Corinthian sounded from the Lady Good Voice Church. City Hall was wide open, the people were dancing in the streets. It was just a, a, a fantastic time. The war was over, and they blew all the whistles, and before you knew it, everybody was at City Hall, and there were parades and flags, and it was just a great evening and it just happened like that you know, they blew some whistles and everybody came we used to have a, a whistle that blew and gloss it was curfew nine o'clock it used to be the north shore theater where the liquor locker is now and that thing blew everybody came right up out of their seats in the theater <laughs> it was so loud but all they had, you could hear it all over town A few weeks after VJ Day in 1945, the Reverend Norman Kellett of Lewiston, Maine, became the next rector of St. John's. He and his wife Marjorie came with an 18-month-old son and moved into the new rectory next door. The parish held a reception for him and his wife on October 21st. One of his first major decisions was to resign from the position at St. Mary's Rockport. With the influx of returning veterans, many, we assume, who needed attending to, he was overwhelmed. Bishop Sherrill appointed the Reverend William Stride as rector of St. Mary's, which continues to be an independent parish to this day. After high school, Adele worked for the Red Cross in the motor pool, but after her father moved on to a military job in England, she was desperate to follow him overseas. We, went, we landed in London the week after VE Day. And then we had VJ Day in London. And I left for uh, Germany with the American Army Hostess Service after that, at the end of the year. Once in Germany, Adele ran a club for 2,000 Allied airmen at a supply depot in Erding, Germany. She was 20 years old. We had a mixed bag of uh, people, and so it was, a, it was a challenge to run a program for them. And uh, well, you never know more than when you're 20, <laughs> really, because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and uh, the bar across the street, which financed my club, was a great, obviously a great draw, because you got drinks for 10 cents a shot. And uh, I had to deal with uh, that problem. and. Uh, and then we, I found the blacks one day. I saw them coming in. The, we had a bakery as part of our club. We did our own food there. And we had this bakery. And I kept seeing these blacks coming in the bakery entrance. And I asked my sergeant, there were, I had a wonderful sergeant who really ran the place. And I said, well, why are all these black soldiers coming in that way? Well, oh, they, they don't think they're supposed to come in any other way. Now, I had just learned very that the black regiment was not housed on the base. It was housed just outside the front gate, off base. 
Well, I was furious. I said, well, I was, I said, there's airmen just like all the rest of you, and they will no longer come in that door. So I, God, I can't remember, I think there was a sergeant or a corporal of the black group that I was able to get to, and I said, now look, this is your club as much as it anybody else's on this base, and you will come in the front door along with everybody else. From now on, I don't want to see one of you coming in this way, and I will be out there and be standing there to be sure that you have no problems. And I did. So we didn't have any problem. In the following year, a room in the basement of the parish house was made available for Sunday school classes and as a robing room for the acolytes and choir. A fine piano was donated, enabling the choir master to conduct rehearsals there. Other improvements included the iron fence and closing the yard on Middle Street. The gas lights, which Abby Thompson had donated, were made obsolete by electric lighting. Her daughter Grace gave her blessing for the installation of the wonderful Gothic lanterns we still use today. Irving Johnson and his wife Electra, world navigators, came to Gloucester after the war with their barkentine sailboat, Yankee. For $5,000 a person, they enlisted crew members for an around-the-world sail. When the Yankee left on its voyage in November of 1947, it was a media event. People lined the shore to watch. Ben Pine's fishing trawler, Columbia, was turned into a party boat for the purpose of escorting the Yankee out of the harbor. 14-year-old Ron Gilson was on board assisting the captain, and the Reverend Norman Kellett was asked to go along for the ride. Bert Hemian, the, the captain, was a Catholic, and he invited his parish priest to, uh, to come along for the ride, enjoy the festivities. It was a beautiful fall afternoon. Piney, being an Episcopalian, he invited his pastor. They cruised out the harbor and everybody was waving and the chowder was coming up on deck and the sandwiches and everybody was having a few drinks. And the parish priest from St. Anne's and the rector from St. John's were back aft in the engineer's cabin. And Bobby Martin said to him, you know, where we just came back from St. Pierre Michelin, and they make a famous room up there, 120 proof. And he says, I happen to have uh, my own personal bottle. Uh, in honor of this occasion, I want you all to enjoy some of this rum. They toasted this and they toasted that. And by the time we got to the head of the wharf, uh, it was low tide. And all the participants had to climb this ladder for probably 10 or 12 feet. And uh, they all did. And some of them were uh, just a tad on the other side of the weather. But they, with, with assistance, they all got ashore. And, uh, and uh, the vessel emptied out. And uh, just about that time, uh, Bobby Martin came up and, uh, and told his uncle, the skipper, he says, we have a problem back aft, Cap. The, uh, the clergy are unable to stand up. What to do? Captain Burt and a crew member uh, got out the fish tackle and the back and a basket. They started up the winch and they put the clergy one at a time in the fish basket. And there's the parish priest going up his arms, stuck out of the basket, his feet stuck out of the other end and we hoisted him up and dumped him right on the wharf. He was flat out on the wharf. We turned the basket, and up came St. John's rector in the same manner. They both were put in a cab and taken home, and by that time, the afternoon was over. That's my, that's my story. I was confirmed here 
I came in 1946 and was married at that time here. And I never realized it that my mother and father were married here. So when I went back and looked at the old books, uh, I found the marriage date of my mother and father. I was just thrilled about it, even to this day. Just like the working women today, I work. I was an administrator assistant for the telephone company. And I was out of town most of my life working, but I was always here on Sunday, very involved even before I retired. And I remember one thing sticks out in my mind about being involved, and I don't know why it does, but a group of us used to put on suppers mostly every Saturday night, baked beans, chowder, and all that. I was still working on, in Boston, but we had a supper for the Unitarian Church to give them all our profits so that they could rebuild the steeple. And uh, that, that was wonderful, you know, to have something like that with another church and do something for somebody else mm -hmm. instead of raising it for St. John's. So that's my first recollection and a good one, a good one, yeah. I was born in 1940. I'm the youngest child of the oldest son of Bishop Rhinelander, uh, and we attended St. John's. I remember distinctly. My grandfather had died in 1939, and my grandmother, uh, who was a large lady, tall as, as well as otherwise, um, never wore anything but black, white, or purple. We always think she wanted to be a cardinal or something, but anyway, purple. And I was a pretty little girl with blonde hair, and she would make quite a to-do coming in, pretending more or less to be leaning on my arm, uh, and we would all march in in a group and take our place on the left-hand side, uh, one pew in from the front, uh, every Sunday. In those days, uh, it was uh, morning prayer, most Sundays. And I would spend a happy time looking at the, the little children in the window, the conic window that was given to, uh, in memory of the Knowles child who died so young. In February, Reverend Kellett presided over the installation of the first of the fine art stained glass windows, which St. John's is now known for, memorializing Marcia Knowles, the daughter of postman Robert Knowles and his wife Madeline. Marcia was three and a half years old when she was struck by a car and killed one Saturday morning in 1943. The little girl was fond of waiting outside by the family car while her parents did their weekly food shopping at the Elwell Street Grocery. It was thought she walked around to the street side of the car and was hit by an oncoming vehicle. The driver never stopped. She was found lying critically injured on the street. 200 friends and relatives, including 30 Gloucester Postal employees, attended the funeral at St. John's. A profusion of flowers banked the front of the crowded room. In the following year, Mr. and Mrs. Knowles decided a stained glass window would be a proper memorial for their daughter. It is the earliest of the memorial windows, and the single window to be designed and manufactured by Charles Connick of Boston. Its subject matter is Christ blessing the children, a theme from the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Throughout the window are several fleur-de-lis signifying purity. The vine, symbolizing the growth of life, is intertwined among the flowers. In 